Um, yeah, sorry, I had to dial in from my phone there. Um, it's my computer wasn't it wasn't cooperating. So, <coughs> so, um, yeah. Um, what? Um, yes. How can I help? So, okay, can we start a meeting now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, for is I have a few questions. Cause uh, I think I'm still a bit, uh, a bit confused about the coefficient. So, um, uh, what I was asking is uh, about uh, um, when we are going to. Uh, so, the objective of, of our research one is to uh, predict the life cycle cost, which you have know already. Uh, the other one already is. Uh, stated in the email is that to find out the factors that influence the uh, life cycle cosmos. So uh, you are uh, you were saying that uh, we should use the loading plot to uh, explain <coughs> what's the factors uh, the most influential variable, right? So, uh, but uh, the final output of this model. Uh, I think is that equation. We should use that uh, equation as a tool for maybe our uh, future, like government agent or uh, other company, to use it as a prediction tool. So we have to explain the the coefficient. So it has to be used. So I, I'm wondering what. Should we say about this coefficient? Okay, so uh, like because you have chosen OPLS, then the predictive loadings is the recommended summary statistics to use with OPLS. So, so that's so. So this is I suppose this is um, where fundamentally, if you you can choose to do many different types of statistics on particular data. So you could do try and do regular regression, linear regression. You could try, um, there's other methods of doing analysis. You could do PLS or OPLS. So because you have chosen OPLS, then the recommended set of data to to work with and quote and cite to say how successful your model is and what your model does and how your model behaves are the predictive loadings. So just because it can give you the regression coefficients doesn't mean to say that the regression coefficients are the best ones to use. They're not in this case. And, and all of the details in Simca would say that it's, it's not advisable to use the regression coefficients because of how the data has been worked and transformed and how everything that you've done to it. So I suppose one of the things to remember is that when you process the data in Simca, one of the, the very first step that Simca does, unless you tell it otherwise, but one of the first things it does is it centers all the parameters and it scales all the parameters. So it means that everything can be considered on the same scale. So if one, so say if one parameter is on a scale of zero to a thousand and another parameter is on a scale of zero to one, then centering and scaling means that you can make those two things equivalent. Okay? And mm -hmm. um, I think one of the problems might be that it's it's stepping back from how you've transformed the data and then what those transformations are telling you to then trying to explicitly say, well if I increase this variable by a factor of 10, then I get an output of something else. Like, I don't think you can definitively make those claims from this kind of result. So my advice would be is you just don't use the regression coefficients. You don't talk about them. You don't need to talk about them. They're not part of the method as such. Uh, but um, what we want to get is to have a equation that can be used in the future like uh, when we get a new project we have a few variables like the salary or the lifespan or the plan price of this project a few variables as an input and then we uh, 
we can finally get the life cycle cost so we can get uh, use as a prediction model that's why um, we want the coefficient but if okay. we only have the predict loadings um, but we cannot but it's but it's not that simple though because like what you've done in OPLS like you can you can use your OPLS model to predict but you have to put the data back into Simca to do it you can't just apply a different equation to try and use it to predict so, so as I as I understand it like so so by choosing to do like you can't as as I understand it right and um, like OPLS is a method that was pretty much defined and created by the person who made Simca back 20 or so years ago so like if you have new data then you can put that new data into Simca and it will process it in the same way that it processed the data that you used to build the model. So it will apply the same, same methods to it and treat it in the same way. And then you can see how well it predicts or you can use it to predict uh, what, you, what but, you could get. But we don't, if we get like the new data for the uh, new project, but uh, so how so, um, and so I, I, the problem, in, in, the problem in, in short, okay. in short, I don't really know how, I don't really know in Simca how you can extract an equate, all of the raw equations to explain. Um, because, um, um, how we create this um, model now is that we have data of 40 cases and also we have the data of the life cycle cost so we have the uh, so we have to output the y's uh, but if in the future if we want to use this model we only have the x variables but we don't have y then uh, the objective is to predict y then how can we to um, use this model uh, to uh, like predict this why if we only so uh, so in that case the closest thing to predict is that is is that equation um that represented your observations and your predicted variable like so the equation of that line is the closest thing you have to work with the equation of what line the, the, you know the um you know the line for observed versus predicted that chart uh, yeah um so so that would be the that would be the closest thing you have to work with so like it's the it's the output of that let me see um i'm just trying to my skype still didn't manage to restart properly here oh uh given this, this part we don't have any we can't like have any input and then so Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so basically, your aim is that you want to be able to describe an equation that you can plug in x variables into, yeah, and then the yeah, and then have the y. So, I don't know if you can do that outside of Simca. So that, like, I, I. Oh, so what, what, what does this um, e coefficient use for, for this OPLS, usually? So, 
they're, so that's the thing. They're not really used in in OPLS. So you use the loading plot. You don't use the regression coefficients. What, what about the PLS? So uh, PLS is like OPLS, but it's just not centered around zero. So it's not a, so OPLS is a version so of the, PLS that's. PLS also don't use the, the coefficient. Um. I don't know. I've not used PLS as much. I've only really used the OPLS. I think um, it's an extension of PLS. So I think basically the it's it's thing just, is just e, it, yeah, but it's, it's so OPLS would be deemed simpler to understand than PLS because what you do is you center it around zero and you give it you give it a starting a starting point that's relative. So, so that's why OPLS would be a simpler version of PLS. Um, but let me see. Like, I don't really understand what is behind it all in terms of like an equation to define the predictive model, like how you can use that outside of Simca. So, Not like sure the, it can be used directly to predict. Yeah, um, let me see. Let me see. Let me try to talk to Jay and see. Okay. Um, does the book provide any information about this? So oh, I'm trying I'm trying to look through um Simca here to see predictions or other works out. Has has anybody you've worked with been using Simca in this way before? Uh, like, is this something that your group does commonly, or like that they would cite these equations or or that type of thing? Uh, I don't think so, but maybe in some paper or the yeah. brochure or guide, guidance book or other. Because. I'm not really seeing a sort of a mathematical output of the the only thing is in there. I'll share I'll share my screen, but like um So but um there is there are e uh, coefficients so it counts for a reason, right? So yeah. Correlation matrix works at statistics. 
I I don't know is the short answer for how you can summarize the output in Simca so that you can use it outside of Simca. I just I just I just yeah. That's the correlation matrix. So, so the correlation matrix is basically some form of it, and um, it's the extent of the correlation between LCC and the various different things. Um, I can um I can see if I can find out the answer for you to to see um it might take a little, I don't know how long it might take to get the result back, but I, I can make an inquiry with some context that we have in Numetrics and see. So really, so what you're looking for is an equation that represents the prediction yeah. and, and how you can plug in values for x to give you a y. Yeah. Okay. So another question is that uh, now we only have the single like variables. So uh, what about adding some cross or square square items to improve this model? It, say that again. You want uh, to add some like uh, cross or square items like, of different x variables. Cross or squared? Yeah. Um, so, you, so, you, so you want to, you want to square the terms and see does that improve it? Is it or? Yeah, to to see if this uh, R square and Q square can improve or not. Um, but the difficulty is that how can we um, like interpret? for the square items, I'm not sure, but do, do, do you suggest that we do that? So when you say cross, do you mean the orthogonal parameters? Um, what? So, so actually, can you show me what you, show me, um, I'll stop sharing it, can you show me an example of what you're trying to explain? Okay, so uh, for, for example, there's some um, salary and lifespan, that these are two x variables, right? So uh, yeah. let's say that salary is x1 and lifespan is x2, and then we add this x1 times x2, and this is the new variable, this is the cross items, cross variables. Or we add like a uh, salary square, the x2, x1 square, this is another like square items. Okay, so you don't need to do that interaction manually. That is already done inherently in 
Simka, right? So the way, so so the way, um, oh, minimize, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, when I uh, creating this model, it shows uh, give us the option to um, manually adding this uh, crossword square items, and after we after I added the results is different. Okay, and is it better? Um, I, I forget about it. Uh, let, let, let me see. Uh, the sum of it, the R2, R square X is decreasing, but this R square Y is increasing. Okay, so so the things that are important for the predictive model are like so you can you can still see my screen, yeah? Excuse me. Okay, can you sorry, can you still hear my see my screen? Us uh, oh I, I didn't okay. Yeah, I can see your screen now. Yeah, yeah. So what this is saying is that fourteen percent of the variables of the x variables account for 86.2% of the variability in y and that's predictive at 71%. So we're kind of with 70 like that's the level of predictability that's that's with this model. So this is basically saying that like 14% of the variable of the data from the variables accounts for almost well, ju or just over 86% of the variability in Y. And it does that, and the predictive value is very high as well. So that means, so this is the value that comes from taking out some data, running the model, and then putting back in the data that wasn't checked, and seeing do, how accurately does it predict it. So it predicts it very well. So this is the, the default. So, so by doing this, this uses the default settings in Simca without manually telling it that there's any relationships so you so what you did then did you so you said it was salary and and what else was related like lifespan i'm not sure i just take it as some example i just randomly select two variables but i'm not sure which, which two or three or will have some interactions Okay, so one of the things that you need to be careful of when you're doing any statistical analysis is that you have to be practical about it. So, like, there's no point making up a relationship between salary and something else if there isn't actually a relationship between salary and something else that you know and understand already that justifies that. Okay. So, otherwise, what? So, by just using the default settings and letting letting it go through the autofit process and checking out what's going on. What that basically says is, so it treats each of the variables that they're independent, um, but it does recognize that there may be relationships between them. And it summarizes the relationships between all the variables in the fewest number of parameters that it can. So there's the predictive, the predictive parameter, which is the main one that we want. And then there's everything else which goes into the orthogonal parameters. So there, that's how the variation between other variables is explained and summarized. So overall in this model, it would say that the orthogonal variables, the first orthogonal vector accounts for 1.7% of the, of this the orthog X's. It, orthogonal components is not related with the Y variable. Right. No, they're not. Okay. But that that's how much of the variability for x is accounted. That's how much of the x data is used up in the orthogonal variable, in the first orthogonal variable. So basically, if you keep going, adding and adding and adding orthogonal variables, they'll eventually all add up to one, because it, it's like you you account for all of the variation in the system. But that's not necessarily a good model. So the aim is to try and do it with as few as possible. So generally in OPLS, you're really focused on the predictive part. And then everything else is, it's more likely to tell you that there's other things in the system that are dependent on each other rather than dependent on on them, on the Y variable. So if we go back to, let me see which plot am I looking for. Um, let me see. 
this one here. Okay. So if we go back to this plot, right? So what this what this plot tells you is that that is where that's where you want to be, right? So things that are as close as possible to this are the biggest predictors of the life cycle cost. Okay. So if you go back along this axis, the first ones that you come across are plant density up here, right? So, so you're, you're kind of, you're moving backwards in a straight line. So the first one is plant density. But because plant density is straight up, it means that it also has an impact on the Y variable, right? So, so this, or sorry, on the, on the components, on the orthogonal components, because it, it has a number up here as well. So the further away from zero things are, the bigger the impact they have, whether it's on the predictive component or whether it's on the orthogonal component, right? So this would say that all of the things that are very close to, to this center line here, so things like indoor or outdoor, whether equipment was used or not, if a discount was applied or not, the lifespan in the area and the maintenance, they all have very little impact on the life cycle costs because they're very close to zero. So if you look at it in, in this side here, they're basically all below 0 0.1, okay? So so anything in, in this kind of space here, uh, can I can even, it's not letting me draw a shape, but anything kind of in, in, in that square here doesn't affect life cycle costs very much. Now that's not to say it doesn't affect it at all, but not very much and not to the point where it's significant in terms of predicting this, right? Whereas the things that do impact this are plant density, the annual replacement rate, um, salary, and the type of systems used to support it, right? So they do have a distinct impact on the life cycle cost, but because they're far away from, from this axis, so if we look on the up-down part, because they're away from zero and, and the up and down section, it means that they also contribute significantly to the orthogonal. So they're both. So they're so it's a bit more complicated. It's not as straightforward that they're purely just predictors for X, for Y. They also have an impact on the other X's as well. So that's so that's why you have to keep them in. Um, so you can't just say. Right, this is, so it's, it does predict Y, but it is also impacted by the X's, right? So what that means is if you take out all of these other X's, the ones that don't seem to be significant for LCC, they can change how well this one is described because it's changed the relationship of everything in the system. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why when you go back to the likes of this table here, where like, even though it's only using, let me try and just shut these down so I can open them up on the same screen. So, so even though it's only using, um, so even though it's only using 14% of the X variable data, it's still giving a really good outcome. Right. But the reason it's only using 14% of the X data is that there's a good lot of it being used for the orthogonal parts as well. So none of these parameters purely are, are so close. To, so really what you want is you'd like one of these parameters to be sitting very close to this line, like lifespan is, only much closer to LCC on this side or way over this side. So either it's really close in the same direction, so it's a positive correlation, or it's the exact mirror on the other direction, so it's a negative correlation. So that's what you're looking for from this. Um, but the fact is that everything that's significant in, in your analysis is both. It's both Y and X. It's significant in both directions. And so that makes it a little bit trickier to understand. Or not even trickier to understand. It just means that they're not as distinctly separated. Okay, so, yeah, so if you were to try and start simplifying this uh, to say what I what you would start with is you'd start with. So when you look at the chart for the scores, who stores, oh, that's the one I wanted. Let's 
Das klappt auch krass. Where do they all go to me? Two new windows open at the same time. So when we look at these plots, right, the way you need to look at them is you need to consider two things with them. The first is the size of the bar overall. So the size of the bar overall tells you how much of a contribution this parameter has to y. So the bigger the bar, the bigger the contribution it has. Um, that shouldn't be in there. Why is that in there? Because that's the LCC. Um, that's because we have PQ on it. Properties. We just want P. <coughs> Okay, so where is this? So when we look at, at one of these, what you're looking for is you're looking for the bars with the with the biggest contribution. Okay, so they're the ones that are the most important for predicting y. You're also looking to make sure that it has the error bar, the confidence interval, does not cross over zero, because if that crosses over zero. It basically means you can't be sure and you can't use it. So immediately from this, it would say that plant density, salary, the annual replacement rate, the plant price, and the type of carrier. Now, this is where you need to get it, become a little bit careful because you've got three types of carriers um, and they show up in different places. So, um, so you just need to make sure that all of them are, are sort of equivalent, we'll say. Um, so... These are the ones that are that have a significant impact. So, so these actually contribute to predicting your Y. All these other things, they don't contribute to predicting your Y. They will contribute to predicting your orthogonal variable. So if you do this for orthogonal, then you'll see that they'll start to be important in the orthogonal where they're not important for the Y. Okay? So that's the first thing you do. Now, the second thing is, if you want to try and simplify your model and say, well, actually, can I take out some of these? So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 or so variables and some of, because some of them are part of the same thing. Um, you would then say, well, which ones have very little contribution to LCC? Um, and you would start with something like, say, the indoor system. So you can see here, whether it's indoors or outdoors, both of those have a very small contribution. So maybe the first thing to do would be to take those out of your model and then run it again and then see what happens to these values here. So if you start to get a bit higher in X, and there's little or no change to R2, and little or no change to Q2, or that they get better, so they get higher, is, is ideal. Then you can say, OK, I can simplify my model, and I'll take out it, whether something is indoors or outdoors has nothing to do with it. OK, so, so that's, yeah. that's a conclusion that you can make. Then you do the same thing for, say, the next largest ones, which might be discount rate and lifespan. Yeah. So That's you can take them out, exactly, and you keep going. Now, one of the things that has been, you might expect something to have more of an impact. So this is quite interesting because there's huge variability in this limit here, right? Yeah. And yet the contribution is very small. So there's something different going on there. So if you click into this data, you can then see, well, is there a problem in the structure of the data set, for example? So what's driving this? Um, so if we look at the area. The area seems to be mostly the same kind of size for different groups. But there's two examples here where it's way higher, right? Yeah. And and this one here is way higher as well. So maybe you need to consider, you, you might need to look at some of the inherent variability in the data sets and is that driving a different problem, right? 
So this is where design of experiment comes into it, of where if you were, so my understanding is that you, these are systems and you have been given the data as it actually happened related to the system. Is that fair? Uh, these are some like special case, like uh, some of the screen was very big, like a very a mega project. So yeah, yeah. So what? So and and the reality is that maybe you have to kind of go. You might you might need to group these into two different types of data sets, where if an area is really big, then this is the prediction of the life cycle cost, or if an area is really sm much smaller, then this is a better predictor of the life cycle cost. Okay, group, group so you can, you basically could make a, when you go back into your original data set, you would, what you would do is, um, so if we look at the data set, you would make a new classification based on size, right? So, so you'd add another column into the data and you would you, you instead of um you could so you could choose another quantitative uh, variables ex exactly yeah and sometimes you might even only add it to like the first way of adding it would be to add it by color right so that you can do something like like this right so so if you add it as a secondary variable as a secondary variable in the original data set it allows you to color code it like here and then you can see well is there visually something going on and um, that that might be that might be related i don't think area came up as anything too particular um if if you looked at the at the, at the other so like if we looked at where is it if we look at the prediction versus observations like if we changed that to area like there's nothing, everything is sort of cooler colored. So like you very few who that are that are high and there's only really one. But it's interesting that it's down in this space. And I would see that that's likely where your model is going to be less accurate because this is where your your error factors start getting very close to absolute numbers. And then just in absolute terms, this makes no sense. If it goes below zero, the cost can't be less than zero. So it just makes no sense. So you'd have to be careful using your model in this region, whereas it's possibly good enough up here, right? Yeah. Now you could still be off by a good bit. So, so this is basically saying like the predicted value is say 2,600, but the actual value was 1,900, right? So is it okay to be out by 200 or sorry, 700? Like is that an okay value to be wrong by? So that's really the question you need to be asking, and or, or does it help, you know? Um, so you might need to break this down into or look at the data in a few different ways. Of if, if for example, those really large data sets are or areas that were plant areas really large, if that's causing a problem trying to predict for some of the other ones, you might need to look at it differently. So, um. So it's all about understanding these outliers. Like, so if you got rid of, say, that one, and that one, and that one, how would that help, or would it, would that make it better? Would that mean that area is more of a contribution to the predictor of the life cycle than than not? Um, so it's trying to understand that. The other one then was the the maintenance frequency. Okay. So intuitively, you might think that the more maintenance I do, the more money it should cost. But maybe that maintenance isn't taking as long. Or maybe if you do more frequent maintenance, that you keep everything alive, and therefore it costs less overall. Whereas if you don't do very much maintenance, then when you go and do maintenance, you have a lot of things to replace, something like that. So you might need to understand more what's driving this. So again, if we click into ma into the maintenance one, it, they seem to be in two groups of where like it's about so are these it was this maintenance um like how many was this done so what does this maintenance number mean like was this how many times maintenance was done in a year yeah, or was this the, it, the annual. annual maintenance so this is basically saying that the, the maintenance was done um 26 times 
in the year. So that was like every two weeks somebody did maintenance on this system, whereas they only did maintenance maybe once a month on this system. Okay. So, so that would make sense then that the, well, or it may not make sense. So, so this is what you need to try and understand from a practical terms. What does this mean in the data? Now, one of the struggles that there is here is um, if we go back to the, to the loadings plot, again, there's too much variability in the, in the data related to maintenance frequency to say the maintenance frequency can be used to predict um, that it can be used to predict what the LCC. Now, it does look like it has a decent amount of contribution, but it's too, it's too variable, like it's not consistent enough. So, so that's challenging. So, so what you can try and do there is, again, similar to area, you can try and see, well, if I understand the variability in this data set, can I either remove things that are actually outliers and get a better idea, or is it real? Like, is it is it genuinely um, not important to the to the life cycle cost? Okay, so we have to go go behind to see. To, uh, yeah. So what's the, uh, combined with the practical? Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, it, and it's the one. It's probably the most important thing when you're doing any statistical analysis is what is actually practical about the system. You know, you you always need to come back to that. So, if something isn't making sense in the statistics, you do need to challenge the statistics and and make sure that it is really a true reflection. And there's no harm in that. There's no harm in challenging it, and there's no harm in questioning it. Um, like one of the things that it does look like. The most thing that predicts the cost is the type of support system that it's based on. Now, maybe that's surprising or not surprising. I don't know. Like when you saw that, the, the, does that make sense to you that the support system would be very important? Um, but if we yeah. that if if we look at the support system though, um, so we change this down to um, the type of system. We put it back to that. It basically says that where the support system is called support, that that is much, much cheaper, right? Yeah. So what that what that would say to me is that maybe you if you need one model for support yeah. and you need a different model to describe the other ones. Yeah. Because so these look similar enough, right? So so they look the same. Whereas yeah. these are not they, these are very much they're separate from the others. They're very much a, just a group of their own. And you need to understand them. Now, my one caution is you only have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight. We have only a small set. Yeah, you only have a small set for them. And we know, for example, that some of these already have wide variations in the data. So like as in this is the one that has the very large area. And so you, you might need to be more careful with that or you might not be able to draw enough conclusions on that yet because you just don't have enough data for for that type. But if you were to get more new data, then you could add it in and you could develop a better model on that. So it's OK. So in your research, for example, it, it, it is OK to state that you you found a particular grouping, but that you there wasn't enough data to build a prediction model. But it would, at the moment, it would indicate that, you know, um, if you use this support system type called support, that the life cycle cost would typically be under 1500 euro or dollars or whatever it is um, per year. I'm, t I'm assuming this is on a per year basis or something to that effect. So you, so you could make a statement like that, but you couldn't necessarily provide a predictive model because you just don't have enough reliable information to do that, that it's not good enough yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it it really it really depends i suppose this is the this is the um the interesting or the tricky part for it so does that does that make sense then yeah yeah makes sense um yeah so so i would i would continue to use your loadings plot and take out variables see how they impact the model and if you're ex if you get better uh, where are we? The model. If if you start getting 
better values for OR2 and Q2, or at least if they're not changing very much, but you're using more of the of the of the X data, um, then that's better in general, right? So the function of the orthogonal components is just to show, so if you had no orthogonal components, right? So if we go back to, um, which part this part? No. Where's my score plot? Loading scar, sorry, what's going on? So if we go back to this here, right? If you only had Y, okay, then everything would be on this line to some degree. And you wouldn't know how much those variables impacted something else. Okay? So if you look at salary out here, it's like salary can be used to predict the life cycle cost, but it also is related to some of the other things in here. Right. So say you were trying to predict area or you were trying to predict maintenance frequency or you were trying to predict something else. OK, it might be more important there. So it so it explains the other. Right. So it's really explaining. So like some of the each of these parameters will explain some of the contribution to the life cycle cost, but then they also relate to other things in the system. So the orthogonal is used to tell you what else is it doing and what kind of equation represents that. So so if you think of it as um, when you go to do your prediction equation, that is drawn in one direction and then the the everything else is explained in an equation that goes pretty much across that, ortho orthogonal to it. Right, so it's it's in a different axis. It's on a different plane. It it's it's in a different um, position to to the to the to the one that describes the LCC. Okay. So uh, it's like uh, you can it, it can explain some a uh, relationship between different variables. Or? Yeah. Let me see. Um, I have some material on it here. Um, let me just see if I can find stuff. So if I can have a second. And So what was this file? It's published by the Santorius 
Yeah, so this is um, training material that's provided by when you take training with Sartorius. This is the material that they that they give you um, as part of that. I don't think I can send this on because um, it's proprietary to them. But, but basically, what you're doing in in the loadings, or sorry, using PLS, is that you are looking to predict the Y variable. And you do this by by creating this line here. So this line is your predictor for Y, right? So this, so this goes into why the loadings numbers are different to the regression coefficients, because what you're, so the loadings numbers are based on the cosine of the angle between, between this line here and the variables, okay? So, so that's how that number is generated, which is different to how the regression coefficients are generated. The regression coefficients are lines through the data relative to one parameter, not necessarily, they're just different in, in what they're describing, okay? But, so what you're doing here is, um, what you're, so this is going to be the predictive coefficient, we'll say, and then that is the orthogonal one. So, so that's what you're, that's how you explain the data. So you want to explain the data in one direction, but you also have to acknowledge that there is data and stuff to be explained in, in other directions. So that's what the orthogonal components do. So for the purpose of, um, this is really why you only need one orthogonal component when you're using OPLS, because it doesn't really matter how many other directions you spin it around the component to explain the other bits. What's most important is what's directly related to um, to the predictive component, which in this case is component one. Okay. So, so the first component is the predictive one, and the second component then, these are the other bits that are orthogonal to it. So the Y variable has no loading in the orthogonal components. So these are things that just don't impact Y, really. There, there's no relationship to Y. And that's why they're they're not not important in it. And um, what else is there? There are the there are the actual equations. So this is how you do it, right? So this is what the data looks like in the real space, and then this is how you convert that into a predictive equation, and how you then get confidence about it. So when you talk about the regression, right? So regression describes the data in its raw format, whereas the predictive components are talking about its ability to be used to predict and how repeatable those predictions are. So that's the other thing that's just different between the regression and the predictive equations. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it is, so it is, and it's giving you good results, and it's giving repeatable results, but there are going to be some limitations around it. So as you can see, if we go back into the raw data, the limitations are when you go to try and predict that your predictions may not hold valid in the lowest region of the of the, the model, but they definitely look like they're reasonable for where um, the support system is either a carrier or a planter. But if it's support... Yeah, yeah, um, but it, it just means that like this equation, you can't predict these that well because as you can see, these are coming up negative, and this is this is actually as bad. Only it just happens to be positive, but it's as it's as badly wrong for one for better description. Um, so it's predicting that the value should be four hundred thirty three, but it's actually only one hundred and four. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, about this. So, uh, when we describe our model, we want to have a like accuracy, uh, predictive.
prediction accuracy so like uh, for example 5 percentage or 20 percent deviation uh, mm -hmm. how, how can we do that provide this percentage or I, I know that there's room mix where uh, arrow and P R M S E R M S E P and R M S E mm -hmm. C V Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. But the 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 thing is that um cause the value ran uh the, the result the life cycle cost the range is very large. So it, some of it is like uh, only hundreds and some of it is for more than Four thousand, so this RMSE might be uh, very large for the small, uh, like some for support system, and might be reasonable for carrier system or the the other one. What is the uh, another system? So how can we like standardize it? This RMSE or SE? Well. You can't standardize it because it is what it is, right? So, it so it any is. Other, a, an, any other indicators to have a better? So, so the only other indicator is the. It goes back to the. Um, what sets it is no. Close these down. Which one is it? So the only other like so this is your factor for prediction, right? So that's how repeatable your prediction really is. Like how how predictable is it in the model? So the higher the closer this is to one, the better. And um, so that's that's pretty high value. So that's considered good, and then. The same with R2, that the closer that is, R2 for, for the Y variable, that the closer that is to 1, again, that means the more of the Y vari variability that you have explained by the Xs. So, so that's good. And then this is how much of the Xs you've used to explain the Y. Now, the problem is, is that whatever you haven't explained is your error, right? So the only way you can really work on making this better is to reduce the error and get it more accurate. So you need to try and understand what's driving that. And if there's any other ways of looking at the data or grouping it or splitting it out to, to see does do you get a better um, predictor if you if you apply maybe different models for the obvious one is the support type. So um, that might be a factor or if there is Maybe if you take out the ones where the area is very much bigger than others, um, that might be a way of doing it either. Um, so you might just need to look at the distribution of individual parameters and see how, how they impact it. But at the moment, this equation really is all you have to go by. It's like how much of your, of your y is explained by the x's and this is the relationship between the x's and the y and um, and then this is how much error there is in the system so we maybe we uh, don't have to show this uh, rmse we only because um it's like kind of doesn't make sense due to the so large range of life cycle well, not really. It makes perfect sense because, like, if you look at, um, so really what this value represents here is if you were to draw a line between, say, this point down to the line and this point up to the line and that one down to the line and all of those, and then you square them and you get the root of the square, that's the value. So that's how much of the spread is in it, right? So there is a little bit of spread around. And when you look at the numbers, so, like, you go down here and it's at, 108 and you go up here and it's at 2200 like they should both be there according to the line but they're not but if you understand what's going on with these two points and see well well what are they you know and um, 
like what's driving this one to be higher and what's driving this one to be lower, then if you understand that, you might be able to bring it in better. My version is that uh, I see that four cases as the prediction set, and another 36 uh, cases as the training set. So uh, we got a model, and then um, one of my supervisor challenged me that, what if you uh, see that another like four cases as the training as uh, prediction set then what was the results so what's the uh, rmse uh, can we get um no so 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 this is so in the material that i sent the other day um yeah, so this, uh, the cross validation is within this model but but what he is saying is about the selection of the uh, prediction set if we randomly select it, can we create a curve for each uh, possible combination of uh, this uh, prediction set and the curve for the RM for other indicators for the accuracy? I don't believe you can do it within Simca because that is what Simca did. Like so, Simca just goes and and it automatically takes one out, puts, leaves it out, checks it, puts it back in, and that's how it calculates the, 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 the Q value. That's where that value comes from, is by taking data out and putting it back in until it's done that for every iteration. So, so, so that's... So, uh, if it's work this way, it does, does it mean that we don't have to manually select like a uh, four to five, um, like 10% or 20% as the prediction set? We just um, put them... Uh, like all, all are the improved cases. Yeah, so like it is doing this, right? But it's doing it with all of the data that you gave it, right? Uh, so that. Yeah. yeah? We, but in my computer, uh, in, I I just see like four as the prediction set. Not all are the. Improved. Yeah. But then that changes the model. So depending on which four you choose, whereas like, did you randomly choose four or did you choose a specific four? Like the ideal thing is that you build a data, you build a model using one set of data and then you get new data or data that somehow is, has been randomly chosen from, from all of it. And you then use that to predict how well um, the new data comes in. So, so what? So when, when Simca does it, it averages it out, right? So, so this Q value is based on averaging out, replacing data, checking it, and putting it back in again, right? So it it uses all of the data in the system to do that. Whereas when you do a training set, and you then will go to, um, you can then do a prediction data set and you then put that against the model, then that's different. Mm -hmm. so, so you could, so, so uh, like, you can do that, and you can do that maybe trying different ways, but really it should be coming back that you're getting about 70% predictability, because that's what the model will be indicating. So if you were to do it, 10 times, seven should be on target and three should not be on target. That's, that's at, at the most basic level, that's what that's saying. Okay, so we, we actually don't have to, um, since we only have 40 cases, we don't have to uh, treat it like the machine learning uh, method to say that uh, 10 or 20 percent as the predictions that we just put all the cases as the input. As the 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 set. is it better than? Yeah, like you can now. It is so. One of the things that you do need to do, and it is good to do, is to double check it. So, like all of your. So, if you use this and you use the forty points, influence from the forty points is in the model, right? So it's 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 built into here. 
even for cross-validation, you take some out and you put them back in again. But as part of actually explaining it, this uses all of the variables to explain it, right? So the R2X and the the R2, they use all the information to explain. It's the predictive value that uses the cross-validation, right? Yeah. So it is, it is subtly different. Now, what you... What you could do is redo this analysis, only use the 36 points, and keep four aside to check how good of a model is your model really at predicting the, the values on, on, the, on the new information. But again, it's not very many data points, so that's the only challenge you have. So like really, if you could get more data, that would be better. Um, like that's the best way of, of dealing with it. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so generally what, what there is a few steps to doing cross-validation. So the first is to check the Q-value. The next one then is to check the permutations. So if you, and so permutations are basically like, if you take the original data and you randomly mess it up, do you get a random prediction that is aligned with your model? So you're basically hoping that you don't, right? So when you run it for this, it's actually pretty good. So there's no random correlation in the model, which is a good thing. And then the third step is to um, check it against brand new data that has never been in the model. So, so, that's really, so that's really your decision of do you build your model with 36 or do you build it with 40? And it all depends on how much do you need those data points, like how important are they to, to, be, to building an accurate prediction. The most important thing of when you're selecting the 36 or the 40 is that they're done at random. The only challenge then could be is that because it's so few, you might not have things that are representative. Like so, you might accidentally end up picking parameters down here, and they might not necessarily work. Whereas it's it's good to understand maybe where the parameters. So if you do two sets of analysis, one with thirty six and one with forty, it's good to understand where the four data points that you excluded in the second set. Where were they in the original set? Like if they were in the at the edges here, that might be problematic because the model mightn't predict them that well. Ideally, they'll be somewhere in the middle where everything else is. So, so that's something else to consider as well. Like there's actually quite a big spread here. When you think about it, it goes from 100 all the way up to 4,000. Yeah, well, I see that. The method yeah. is like it's based on the like proportional to the number of cases of different type of system. So I select one of the support system and two from uh, carrier system and one from, from the planter system. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. not randomly, so. Yeah. yeah. So like the other thing about all of this is that these statistics, they're, they're used for an indication. They're used to help forecast, but how accurate you can do that depends on, it really depends on how much data you have to start with and how stable the systems are. So like where the variability in these X's are, like so, so like if you go into any one of these parameters and you go into the annual replacement rate, like how variable is that? Like that's quite a lot of variability in the annual replacement rate. Um, but it, so it's understanding again why is the annual replacement rate so much lower for system where it's support yeah. than for where it's a carrier? So, like, if you understand some of those things, that can then help you predict it better as well. Or even in this system, like, why was this one so low when everything else is much normally up here? So, so again, it, it's just understanding what it is that you're looking at. Um, because the best models will have things that are stable, you know, they're typical situations, if that makes sense. So you need to really make sure that the data is representing typical situations and the things that are atypical for whatever reason, that if they are causing a problem that they're removed. Now, if they represent things and they're true then leave them in but if they're not if they're causing a problem and and then then you take them out so that's the that's the other thing of like how should you screen the data so like 
when I did the analysis, I didn't remove any data points. I didn't, I didn't consider because I don't know the background to what drives this. Like, like, why is this rate so high and that rate so low? Like, what was behind that? Which one is, is there a reason that one is higher or lower? And what's behind, what justifies that? So it's understanding things like that as well. But at a very high level, the first sort of pass through of the information tells you that big ticket items that are important to contributing to the to the why. But it doesn't necessarily tell you immediately what has gone on in the X's that drives that behavior. So you might need to take a, a closer look and in, in at each individual case and understand, well, why are these two so low? And why is this one so high? For example, the same up here, like what went on here that this is really high and yet these are really low. So, so that could cause issues um, in, in things like and you might be right in things of like, is the annual replacement rate tied to the maintenance frequency? So the more maintenance you do, the more replacement you do. Or is it the opposite that if you do more maintenance, you actually end up replacing things less? So there might be some you, you mentioned um, terms that are not necessarily independent. So it might be worthwhile checking to see. Uh, I don't know if I can. There is a way of doing it. Um, observations. But so the. Sometimes there's a way I've, I'm forgotten now how you do, but there's a way that you can add in two variables onto the same plot, and it can sometimes be good to to just show you. Let's Okay. So there's so for example, if you look at both of these things here, there isn't now that one's quite interesting there. So the replacement rate is really low for that one, and yet the the maintenance frequency was really high. So maybe there's something in that. Um, these ones two here now I know the scales are a bit challenging, so I'm not sure if we can stick them on different scales. This is where Simca isn't necessarily the best at visualizing down to this level. But, you know, that would be something to try and dig into to see, is there a reason where, like, when, you're, when your replacement rate is higher, is it because you're doing less maintenance mm -hmm. than when you're doing more maintenance? Or why is this one, like, this one looks to be pretty steady for, for, um, for replacement rate, and yet, like, this is clearly an outlier in for the carrier systems, whereas like it's not necessarily so much of an outlier for the support systems. So to understand what what's the driver there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I maybe I should to dig into it to find more information. So um, can can we look at the score plot? The scores plot. Yeah. Um. This one or yeah. the loading score? Uh, the this scores. Yeah, yeah. The basic scores. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what can we find from this plot? So basically, what you do with this plot is you look at this plot in conjunction with this plot. So let me um, let me just put these up onto the same screen. Oh dear, we have to shut down lots of things. Um, Okay, now. So, basically speaking, when you look at these two in the same, in the, at, at the same way, if you consider the quadrants, right? So this is one quadrant, this is another quadrant, and another one, and another one. Things that are in this quadrant here are broadly speaking related to this. Things that are in this quadrant 
are broadly speaking influencing this and things that are in this quadrant are influencing this here so you can clearly see this so now it's it's quite broad okay so so this is more of a just a very high level kind of type idea but you can see it so if you see here that system type equals support right so that's in this space all of these now we just happen to have a colored by system type support so it makes it quite easy but all of these are in that region right so that's clearly a grouping where system type support is very different from where it says system type carrier which is up here and system type planter which is here and you can kind of see that carrier is green so there's more greens up here and the blues less so but if you if you look at it the blue is quite close to the y line but it's also quite close to the x line sorry to the predictor and the, and the orthogonal so it might it just doesn't have as strong an influence so that's really what you're saying as well so something like this where it's far away from both axes um, it means that there's a more distinctive influence and you can quite clearly see here that there's, that there's a distinctive influence whereas if we were to change this to being something more like plant density so if i if i change this one over here to um to plant density um so you can see right so this up here says these have high plant density which would imply that if you go directly diagonal this means that this area has low plant density okay and that's confirmed by if we look at the color here and so this represents plant density where this is low density and this is high density you can see that down here is low density and up here the density is higher but again it's quite scattered true so basically this uh, corresponding results will be uh, like accord with the final loading plot that the important variables exactly yeah now it's you know you you use the the column plot is the best way of figuring out which are significant but this gives you a very kind of quick and and easy way of sorting out what's what's what the relationships are right and if you use the color coding like the, the options for coloring it can help display that as well so like so this is this is a classic example of where for the system type support all of the the density happens to be much lower so that could be something of interest that that's maybe ha we haven't really considered yet in any of the discussions which is is the plant density lower because it's support or is the you know that would you put higher density setups do they go into carriers and planters does that make sense yeah. so like are you limited by how dense a support i don't know does that mean that it's a frame or something like that but like is there a maximum density that can that that can be used for support and once you cross that number then it has to be a carrier or a planter so they might be things that are worthwhile understanding and and again it could be just more reasons why you would take out um the support system out of it because that drives some other things as well so that maybe means that the area can't be big now this looks like this would look more like that bigger area you'd use support whereas you wouldn't use um the carrier or or the planter necessarily because they're the opposite side right so so if we change this to area um it's not, it's just not as clear cut with area so area is more variable this is slightly bluer but it's it's not and there's definitely an outlier there so so that's potentially one value now it's an outlier in the sense that the area is so much bigger it's not an outlier in the formal sense and that it's still inside so the circle here defines um 95 percent confidence interval so you would expect to see five percent of your data outside of it and um, for particular things so that's okay though like it's not way way out it's just only a little bit out and so that's okay to have one or two bits out <coughs> excuse me um so does that help at all yeah. yeah yeah okay and what you're and again what you're really looking for is that anything so this is your why this is what's important so anything that's close to that 
So if there was something that was clustered around that, that then is more relevant to the, to, um, to your prediction. This means that there's no, uh, what the life cycle costs. So what can we see from this, this two plot for the life cycle costs? Well, don't forget that this is only the, um, so for life cycle costs, Basically, what it's saying is that there's no one thing that that's absolutely close to it. But now, if we go to plant density, um, which was one, like this area here is, you know, so anything in this space is is more closer to to the Y there, right? Um, but this is more for the X's. Like, what region are the X's in? This happens to have the Y on it as well. And on where are they? So where, where is everything? Okay. So I think this helps us a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. May I know how many hours left for the consultancy? Um, oh, I don't know how many hours were. I'll find out how many hours were on the order. And I can tell you then how many are left. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just know there was a total value, but I don't know what rate that was in at per hour. So I'll find that out. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I think maybe I continue to fix something out. And then if I have ad any other questions, questions. I just send yeah. you email. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. no problem with that. Or if you or if you prefer to do work and then send me a file and then if you want to discuss it like this, then that's no problem either. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for this session. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, yeah, I hope that was of help. Um, so I'll ask. So the two things for me to ask is, is there an equation that you can use it yeah. can we can we summarize the work in in the format of an equation and which is the best one yeah. um and so i will ask that of new metrics and see if i can get an answer okay okay and then i'll come back to you with the hours as well okay okay thank you excellent okay well thank you very much um best of luck i hope it all goes well for you have a good day yeah, you too. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.